Yo, we're taking a little bit of a documentary dive when it comes to snooker. Hey. Now, we did it with uh, darts, and we've done some little clips of snooker, but haven't really gotten a chance to soak it all in. You know what I mean? I feel like the documentaries are, they help shed light on the why. You know, the why snooker instead of of just snooker snooker putting it in clips you can't get the whole feel for it in little snippets right they give you the how they give you the what but they don't give you the why so let's see i'm ready i'm excited all right let's go in three two one heading back to a green and pleasant land that was snooker loopy britain Ever since I was a when this man was boozing and blubbing years before Gaza, madman, but genius with a cue. Johnny Vegas. The greatest player I've ever seen in my life. This man was the fastest perm in the West. This man only came out at night. Dracula. Yes. And when even <laughs> this man had a nickname. Interesting Davis. I became a winning machine during the 80s. And when breaks were big. In fact, I had a dream about it, I guess about two weeks before that, you know, that I was going to make a 147. Yeah! And players were pop idols. But hey, I was on top of the pops. I'm famous. And there was more drama than Gladiator. Miss it, Ginger. Miss it, Ginger. It goes in a win. If it doesn't, I don't. It obviously was one of the biggest sporting moments. Snooker was the number one sport. Those heady days when snooker ruled the world. such a foreign concept of a barroom game being all the hype yeah that is that is something that i i can't wrap my head around that like to it, it same thing with darts that's why to me it's so intriguing it's like darts like what and then snooker what mm -hmm. like pop idols top the guy was on top of the pops like what yeah, they were freaking rock stars. Like what? I'm. I can't wait. Ah, dude, let's just let, let's just get into this because this is. I have so many questions, dude. Mm -hmm. Let's let it cook. Snooker had been the province of spivs and social clubs until color television and the start of Pop Black in 1969. It was probably the most important thing in the game at the time. I was allowed to treat him on the Tuesday of watching Pop Black and then off to bed, you know. And the last thing he wanted was the doorbell ringing when that was on because you only got half an hour. If you won Pop Black, that was probably as good as winning the World Championship. Oh, a lovely shot. Great shot by Taylor. Women love watching Pop Black. Uh, I think a lot of it's to do with the way the players dress. That makes sense. Bad clothes. And then I remember that more than anything. Uh, the big ruched shirts and what have you. The first part black, as we all know, was in, in black and white. Now, Cyclone Sid is going for the uh, light black ball on the left. <laughs> we're trying to bring the white back past the light grey ball and in behind the slightly darker grey one. <laughs> Pop black introduced to everybody ted Lowe, and so we're all set to go whispering ted Lowe. john spencer has terrific cue power see this cue ball come back oh i wish i didn't say those things you imagine him some kind of lover lover man with a voice like that who just drifted into snooker the bbc chose snooker really to test out color on television for those of you in black and white it's the green over that bottom bucket that he's looking at <laughs> Ted, as well as being a great commentator, used to come out with some classics. It's behind the pink, but the yellow is on that side cushion. And for those of you in black and white, it's just behind the blue. It was very soon <laughs> number two in the BBC ratings. Now, to make the draw for the uh, groups, we have one of our most avid viewers, a great sportsman, raconteur and entertainer extraordinaire, Mr Eric Walker. Congratulations. Thank you very Lovely. much. 
<laughs> Ernie wants one of those. <laughs> Eric. Yes. Eric. You've got a good memory for names. How, how, how often do you watch the burger? Oh, as often as I possibly can. I've seen it uh, once. Yeah, by the time there'd been a series. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, That's probably where Johnny uh, Vegas got his sense of humor from, hey, among other things. It, yeah. Of course, I feel like when when a sport is is elevated beyond the, the pub, you're going to have a lot of characters. Oh, yeah. Right? And, because and you find characters in the, the pub. In the pub. And they make their way to the television. And so it's like... I love that. I love that. Of course, and you're gonna already have your 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 uh your, that sense of humor that they all have. You mm -hmm. know, like that witty, no no punches held. Like I love that when he was on the, for those of you black and white in black and white. It's my it's on the blue one. I love that. I love that. Uh, That's genius. Yeah. Oh. I love gotta love British sense of humor, huh? Yeah, man. It comes everywhere. It, everywhere. everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or two series, then they, they became um, faces that were known to all of us. Brilliant oh. shot there by Reardon. Ray Reardon was fab. I loved it because he was always, you always thought that he should be in the Munsters. He was jocular but without the intimidation because he just looked like he'd been a night nurse. Black head of hair with the widow's peak, you know, the teeth in it. And well, when you're at the table, you, you made sure that you, you, your opponent, you'd turn round to him, you see, and he'd give him this glare and make sure he saw the teeth. The eagle and Elizabeth Sky. Oh, a lovely shot. Ray Reardon's my hero. He was my hero. He's my hero. He'd just play safety shots on them until they hung themselves. Oh, Reardon has played it safe and playing for a snooker. He used to walk around the table as if it was his own. And if he missed a shot, it, was, it wasn't his fault, it was the table's fault. Well, very nearly, but not quite. I can't oh. believe I've missed that. There must be something wrong with that cushioning, test of cushioning. As a result of it, I became a celebrity, and I was invited to every every show that was going on on, on the television. It's not a stick, is it, Ray? It's, um, it's a, a, a queue. queue. Ah, yes, yes, a queue. It's, it's been called queue. many things, actually. I, it's been called many things, yes, yes, like me. These oddest people came through who were suddenly sex symbols. Do you know what I mean? It was a bit unnerving thinking that your mum would be fantasising over Ray Reardon. <laughs> a kid's version, a sort of... <laughs> like I said, celebrities. Oh, my mind went... All right. I mean, oh. look. I mean, they might as well be ranch because they be dressing, so... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder they were oh. celebrities. Yeah. Ranch is a type of salad dressing or dip, guys. Just letting me know. <laughs> Did we need to explain that? Uh, probably over the uh, across the pond, man. It's probably across the pond. I don't think I don't think ranch truck goes anywhere. Even though they have a wing stop, they do. Eh, ranch Ra is best best eaten in bulk here. Yeah, they do know ranch. They just know it as a WTF America thing. That, yeah, because we put it on everything. One hundred percent. Ranch grows from the ranch tree in Alaska. Everyone knows that. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a, Alaska's best invention is ranch. So I'm 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 all right with that. I attempt a joke, and this is where it goes. <laughs> it's it's more of a it's more of a TED talk. So now you know. <laughs> What's this got to do ranch? with snooker? Don't, don't you don't don't you joke about ranch? <laughs> ranch is deadly serious. <laughs> Can't take us anywhere. Oh my god. <sighs> of potty train black became an instant hit and brought us a new generation eager to jump the queue to stardom well it was ted lowe who had the great idea and he decided to have a junior version of it and from the liverpool kids. john parrot and i turned up in a brown suit with a chocolate brown shirt and tie and i had like a german helmet you're gonna get stick coming for people wearing a suit like that, so that one got binned. <laughs> Some really good players in there. Neil Folds was one who was played in there. Dino Kane played in it. And now let's meet the youngest ever player in Pop Black. He's just 14 years of age, Stephen Henry. It was the first time I saw him, and he was, he was very small, just about big enough to reach over the table. 
and it was obviously my first time on TV at age 14. Um, fair and ever, I can but I loved it. My mum had uh, taken me out and got my suit made and, and um, bought the, the, the shoes. I think I had a pair of light grey shoes that they looked white on TV. Looking back now, it's a cringer. <laughs> lost in the semi-final so I'd call Steve Bentham. <laughs> Steve Bentham then from Mitchum clears the table following a mistake by the 14-year-old young star from France. Yeah, I felt like crying on national TV. You must be very, very pleased, Stephen, with your first, second appearance on television there. Were you very nervous? Yes. I wasn't as nervous as in my first match. He went on to win seven world championships, so uh, if I'd have known then what I know now, I'd probably drown the little bugger. Tell me how you really God. feel. Oh man, isn't that crazy? He's probably the last person that beat him. <laughs> like it's like um it's like someone beating Michael Jordan in basketball in high school. Yeah. You know? It's like, oh, I'm better than you. And then this man goes to change everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like damn. Yeah. Damn. I got a question. Do you have to be dressed up to the nines to play snooker? Because with billiards and pool, you can just wear what I'm wearing and get away with it. Yeah. I'm just thinking, if I was on that circuit, I'd be the John Daly of uh, snooker, I, you know, I, performing in just a T-shirt and, you know, a, a red, I'd look like a proper redneck. Yeah. I don't know if they would, they would allow it, man. I just don't think – I think it's the pageantry that makes it appealing. You know, I think it's the the bow tie and the dressed upness that drew drew it there. Cause I mean, it, it, it's 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 a, you would never see this at a pub, you know, yeah. ever. Yeah, you'd see it at a you know a, a dinner party, a dinner party, <laughs> a highfalutin uh, uh, alcohol establishment, uh, yeah, whatever like, you call that. Like the, they had their suits made, like tailor made for them. Like, whoa, that's, yeah, that's okay. So I mean, I would assume. A suit was mandatory, like or, or whatever they're wearing, had yeah. to be mandatory. I guess so. Because I mean, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine kids wanting to dress up like that. I, don't I, know. I not in a million years. I don't, yeah. I don't think so. Must have been a different time. Oh yeah. Yeah. Irish American himself, Alex Higgins. Here's another hurricane Michael Fish couldn't have seen coming. Alex Higgins is in town. He played snooker with flair, flamboyance, and a flagon of Smirnoff to hand. Snooker would never be the same after the hurricane. Fantastic wow. snooker player to watch, a real entertainer. Yeah, you saw that, right? Where yeah. the black ball just went it's on the edge. Rolled on the edge. <laughs> and then like, went into the hole. Like, I, I didn't know that was an option. Well done. Well done. Well, well, <laughs> well done, done, Alex Higgins. <laughs> yeah. Damn. My favourite player has to be Higgins, Hurricane Higgins. I just loved him. It was that kind of unknown quantity. You know, madman, but genius, with a Q. True Alex Higgins style. You can't underemphasize the effect that Alex Higgins had on Snooker. Irish Hurricane himself, Alex Alex was just a one-off. They loved him, win or lose. There'd be 40 blokes up in the rafters, you know, in that kind of... Come on, you brother! Everybody <laughs> else very well behaved, and, and, and him with his own particular following of Party 7 carriers. Bloody <laughs> Mary. I didn't know you could have anything more than a single. Do you know what I mean? He, he, he kind of pushed the concept of, no, put three or four in, unless of a mixer. Even by the misspent standards of snooker, he was no role model. But to a sport starved of glamour, he was, well, who was he like? You can imagine David Beckham now. It was on similar lines. What? That's called casting all course into the winds. And he was the, the first of the outrageous snooker players, you know, that played shots that other people had never even tried before. Swerve around the green, onto the top cushion and onto the red. Oh no, he's taking it. Oh. Did everything wrong. He stood wrong, he moved on the shot. Thanks for being a wonderful one. I'd like to finish off now with the one and only Hurricane Higgins. You used to sort of live every shot with him. 
and his nostrils are flaring and his eyes are all over the place and he's twitching everywhere. There was also that, that, that kind of invisible fly that tick that he had. On the edge, just about in control of himself. Higgins puff. So Higgins was uh, the first rock and roll snooker player. There you go. There yeah. you go. You, you always have to have the one. Like it, that's the balance. That's the balance. You got to make it appealing for everyone. Like just kind of like how you just wanted to put like the t-shirt on and go in and like redneck it up. Cause that, that's just, that's awesome. That's yeah. you need that. You need that balance. You yeah. can't be all uptight. You got to have the, the outlier. The every you know, man. Yeah. Like we saw that in the in the darts too. You gotta yeah. have your rock stars, your your larger than life personalities. Your Phil Taylors. Yep. You gotta you gotta have those. In yeah. in a sport. That's what that's what makes it a healthy sport. Exactly. Relatability. Yep. Nope. his way out of a bleak Belfast in the early sixties. A backstreet snooker club called the Jam Pot was his finishing school. He liked the snooker. Um more so probably in school. In the chalking of a queue, the snooker world was buzzing with talk of this talented and turbulent young Irishman, and the Higgins family had a real star in their midst. The gypsy came to the door and she said, oh, we have a star in the family. And the mother said, well, I'll be my own. And she says, no, she says, it's a boy. A provincial British legion was the glamorous setting as Higgins won the 72 World Championship at his first attempt. Winning just 480 pounds, it cost him 100 pounds. Sorry, Bless you. Bless sorry, you. <laughs> sorry, just, oh. <laughs> oh, I'm back. We'll cut that part out. All right, thanks. <laughs> Pounds to enter. Actually, the back winning was bit. the glamorous setting as Higgins won the 72 World Championship at his first attempt. Winning just 480 pounds, it cost him 100 pounds to enter. Actually, at this moment, I think I'm in a bit of a daze. Although I think I'm just starting to come out of it, you know, and realize that I'm uh, the world champion. We obviously knew it was an achievement, but to what extent? We didn't really know, because we didn't know anything about snooker, and mother and father didn't either. <laughs> For the next 10 years, Higgins travelled the country playing to packed houses, usually licensed ones, and people adored his unpredictable genius. You didn't know whether he was going to throw his toys out the pram or he was going to make a hundred. You didn't know at all, and nobody <laughs> knew, and I don't suspect Alex knew either. Another girl after the very first shot, the tie would come off and be thrown across the place. He was the only one that kept the kind of rough ass snooker all image alive within snooker. He had this habit of licking the white ball. And oh. people started saying, well, you can't, you can't let him lick the white It's disgusting. Showmanship was part of Alex Higgins' life. I mean, the number of times we've seen him walk in wearing a grey fedora and ah, to the crowd, and Alex was in charge, centre stage. He took over the place. I've tried to be like him with uh, Cassius Clay, Elias Muhammad Ali, and uh, I think for a sportsman, you know, he's so prolific, you know, he's brought a lot of interest into boxing, new interest into heavyweight boxing, and I think I've done the same for snooker. Give the people what they were there to see, entertain them. That's what he was, an entertainer. The idea is to try and put the black ball on the left-hand top pocket. You won't see me here, but I'll wave. Thanks very much, Alex, and <laughs> thanks, Jimmy. It was an unexpected visitor. Uh, Everybody remembers his epic semi final with Jimmy White. It was the clash of the two most exciting players in the world. Jimmy White to Brick. And it was kind of like a shootout at the OK, OK Corral. <laughs> two cool buds. That was them, not their bar order. They battled and bottled it out for a place in the 82 final. What a pace this match has been played at. And they were such a good friends, and we'd met Jimmy on different occasions, so you were feeling it both ways for <laughs> brother and for Jimmy. Oh, marvellous. So Jimmy White concedes. What a splendid finish. So the people's player now has a chance to really be the people's champion. 
I think if you look for the biggest contrast in snooker, it would have to be Alex against Ray Reardon. I mean, there was Alex, the terror, <laughs> and Reardon, the elf. Yeah, look at these two. They are just polar opposites. Love it. And I love that they 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 live in the or they thrive in the same sport, you know? It's like I love that. You need like this is what makes the sport healthy right here. The contrast, the two different personalities. Yeah. A uh, rivalry as yeah. it were. That's that's who that's what a sport needs. And I love this, man. It's I I, I would love to have watched this, like especially know who he is and then been a like been alive during this cuz I bet that was a, I was massive on TV when it came out. I believe it, 100%. Elder statesman. So what a final we have to look forward to. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. First frame. And it's Alex Higgins to break. And she was a bundle of nerves. I mean, she just couldn't watch it whatsoever. I spent the whole day. Just couldn't make dinner, couldn't do anything, just couldn't sit down. It's hard to explain the feelings just, that you do have. It's just this big, like, butterfly mm -hmm. that just keeps pounding at you. She's got a massive great break to finish the match. And everything's starting to flow now for Alex Higgins. And that's perfect. That certainly must be the shot that makes the title set. <laughs> Ray Reardon has sat in his chair for the whole of this final frame. Wow. Fantastic. Ten years after his British Legion triumph, the hurricane breezed his way to the World Championship. The sport was now fashionable and wealthy. There was joy, there was tears. There was just a mixture of everything. Emotions were all haywire. Alex called for Lynn and baby Lauren immediately. Crying, oh, give me man. my baby, give me my baby. Everybody Aww. was just so welled up with emotion that, that he'd done it, and then and then he had his family there and he was holding her and whatever. I could That's feel good. sort man. of what he was feeling when he did have the baby. That comfort zone, that holding on, this is mine, my baby. I'm one. I sort of I felt a bit different. I was younger than Anne, and I was sort of like going, is this for real? You know, is he really crying? Or, you know, if he is, he really deserves an Oscar for this one, you know? <laughs> and then he scrapes his eyes out, do you know what I mean? And he had his, his daughter there. You know, and he's like, I did it for you, love, I did it for you. And his, his daughter's just like, the eyes are gone. You know, she'll never remember that moment. She'll just remember this sudden gust of vodka and orange. <laughs> I was out there. <laughs> Sun gust of vodka and orange. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh man. To even that that's the British thing to pick apart a wholesome moment <laughs> like this. He's like, oh he uh, just remembered that. Uh. Oh man. <sighs> Gotta love it. Yeah, man. It is, it is Johnny Vegas, though. So yeah, very true, very true. It, it is kind of his job to, to make those insights. I did it. It was me. <laughs> I remember. I remember back to that. Anyway. Uh, anyway. Anyway. We're on the floor, and I thought there's no way I'm going to go in here. Just keep out the way and let it happen. No words I could say could add to that. She is the etta. I mean. Alex's whole persona was stripped open for the nation to look at. But Alex soon faded like the froth on a Stella, and for the rest of the 80s, a rather more sober character ruled snooker. From London, the Plumstead potting phenomenon, Steve Davis. Davis didn't smoke, drink or gamble. He potted and he potted until he swept all before him, winning six world titles. Every sport would have loved to have had Steve Davis as the world champion. He dominated the 80s. He just sort of potted them all, and he was kind of quite smug. Are you a Saint Steve? Yes, I am. I hated Steve Davis with a passion, and, and my whole family did. <laughs> Any word you can describe for Davis was awesome. 
today we've got Steve Davis here, who at 19 is London and home county's junior snooker king. Oh. Hi. I, I used to stutter all the time, and I was very really shy and introverted, and I was the type of person I think that you'd have been pleased to, for the school bully to beat me up. I play at the working men's club, Pumpsley Common Working Men's Club, and I travel over to Romford, where there are better facilities and um, better players to play against. The charisma bypass had taken early, you know, he was, he was very shy. But you could see straight away that he was a player. The moment I got a snooker cue in my hand, I changed. Wow. As a player, you couldn't ask for anyone better. The ability to practice for hours. Now, other people at that time were not paying that price. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> Barry Hearn became Steve's manager. But they were more like family. I think we developed a, like a, not a father and son, but a big brother, younger brother relationship. Before Davis, snooker player's idea of training was a session at the local Burnley Inn, followed by a workout with the barmaid. Those days, there was a couple of tournaments. After a, most of it was exhibition work. When you finished, go out and have a meal, go to a nightclub, have a few drinks, you know. He came along, took us all by surprise. Didn't drink, didn't go to nightclubs, and went to bed early. Mm. Now, what fun is that? A uh, six-time world champion. You know? Yeah. He's more uh, by the book. By but the book. Then, I don't know. You know I guess it, it's sport. Uh, Go yeah, ahead. It, every, every, every avenue is a valid one. Yeah. You can yeah. have your party animals that get there, but, I mean, you know, I feel like that's not sustainable. His way of living and his way of playing is more sustainable. Right, right. It's like, like Tom Brady or... Even Jeff Gordon, like, that yeah. didn't really party too much, knew the sport in and out, and, you know, won a lot, but didn't really get a lot of fanfare. Yeah, pretty much. Until, until like, later job. in their careers. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, like, every sport would love a per uh, an athlete like that. Just yeah. no, no, no drama behind the scene. Just sport. More advertiser friendly. Yes. Yes, one hundred percent. That's why we sometimes we have to watch our fucking language here. Yes. Yes. They probably we just can't. demonetized us by doing that. What? Right? How dare you? How dare it just I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. With the amount of music that's being played, I, I don't think that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. It's been a very lit soundtrack. <laughs> yeah. Which is a good thing for us watching, watching? and a bad thing for us uh uploading. Uploading, this. yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah, and so yeah, go ahead, say whatever the fuck you want to say on this. <laughs> I'll think of something. Yep. For years, thought somebody built him in a garage. Do you know what I mean? I was waiting for the scandal to break out that, that he'd been made from tractor bits. <laughs> the Romford robot reached his first major final in 1980. He was for real. Steve Davis is about to don the crown of UK champion. We're all going, hi, hi, who's this? What's happening here? I'm sure as the years go by, you will see him, as I hope to, wear the world crown. Davis had paid his dues, he had his apprenticeship, but 1981, the final, was when all of that crystallised into achieving our goals. Only Burley ex-miner Doug Mountjoy stood between 23-year-old Davis and his first world title. They always said in those days that you can't win the World Snooker Championships until you're 40, because you're not mature enough. And we bucked the whole system. There's now 22 points on the table. And as you see, this difference in the score is 22 points. Watching those last few balls go down against Doug Mountjoy, and talking to yourself saying, now don't do anything silly, just sit here calmly and enjoy the moment. And the moment I popped the, potted the last couple of balls. And that's it, the world snooker champion, Steve Davis. Nice. I remember looking up to the sky. The relief when it's over is astonishing. It's not the winning or the losing, but I felt the tears welling up because it was just finished. I think I'd probably cried if I'd have lost. It wouldn't have made any difference. <laughs> the next thing I knew, I was on the stage hugging him. The steam train hit me. It was probably oh. his first thought, knowing Steve was, oh, God, what's Barry doing now? 
think I gave him a body check that would have knocked out <laughs> most second row forwards. He was going like that in front of the television cameras. The camera couldn't get anywhere near me. It was marvellous. The feeling of actually <laughs> achieving it when you've set your targets over so many years, you know, you just can't describe the words that that was. It was an I told you so, you know? You, we were going to be the best. He was everything I didn't want to be in any walk of life. <laughs> Which is really sad in a way because you're going, what a winner. <laughs> you get this terrible quote in Stone. <laughs> Johnny oh, Vegas is making Johnny this Vegas. talk for me. Yeah. They picked the right person to, <laughs> to, to, to guest appear in this doc. <laughs> it was everything I, I never wanted to be in any walks of life. It's like, <laughs> you mean a winner? Like... <laughs> <laughs> the same guy that. Um, was a little too intimate with a carp, so uh, yeah. I, uh, take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> oh, God. ...about a misspent youth. And the only person that's never said it to me is Steve's bank manager. He loves it. He thinks the best spent youth you could ever have. We have I became a winning machine during the 80s. He dominated snooker from Steve's favourite phrase would always, you know, I want to get his brains in a jam jar and put them on my mantelpiece. Well, he became the um, the biggest name in the sport, didn't he? It's as simple as that. You know, every time you turn the television on, who was standing there holding the cups in the air? It was Steve Davis. I just putted the balls and kept my head down, and Barry did the business on talking me up and creating, uh, you know, the image off the table and selling me as a, a commodity. The good manager. Hello, Barry Hearn. Also known in the business as Barry Earn. Yes, well, if you're talking about... No, if you're talking about an afternoon and evening... See, I'd do... If we were in your area, we'd do 12.50 for the night time. It wasn't really me that developed Steve Davis. It was the, the real Davis emerged. Have a come on, Steve. Understand we all need somebody to clean on. We were on every show. Hey, can I have your autograph? Yeah, sure. <laughs> can I have yours? Oh, you'll have to get to the back of the queue. <laughs> he just didn't seem to ooze any character whatsoever. The end result was that Spitting Image came along and, uh, and did a puppet on the strength of that. I don't think Steve Davis's persona would be as big without the Spitting Image cartoon. Jimmy's got a name, Whirlwind. Alex has got a name, Hurricane. Why haven't I? All right, we'll call you uh, Very Good. As that, Steve Very Good Davis. We just collapsed. I think we learnt the script off by heart so we could do it to order. Steve, extremely professional indeed, Davis. That's a good one. No, it's not, it's boring. As soon as the spitting image puppet came along, that was it. You only thought of the spitting image puppet and not of the real guy. I don't want to be boring, I want to be flamboyant, different, exciting. All right, all right, all right, Steve. People started coming up and saying, Steve, you're not boring. You are, you know, don't take any notice. I go, yes, I am. I've got it. Yeah, it's good to know your, your, uh, your image and know your limitations of your character. So this was like, uh, what, what would, I would compare this to Barack Obama's anger translator. Oh yeah, Key and Peele. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like that's that's kind of what I would I was. You have someone that sees this and is a fan of this and likes this, knowing that he does not have a personality or not. That's not his brand. So it's like. Yes, I like this idea. Yeah. Like he he's he's taking it in stride. I mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. It, it's like I know that I tell bad jokes. Sometimes I talk shit. I, I get that. I accept that. <laughs> I come off as phony sometimes. <laughs> I accept that. I, I say mean things. I put people in their place. I get that. Yep. But, uh, but you know, like, especially on that level, he could have gotten all butthurt. About it, he could have, you know, he could have. But it's it to what it, to what point? Like that's that's the worst way to react to something like that. Right. He Just embraced it. it. Yeah, he, run with it. He ran with it and helped. It made it to his advantage. Yes. And that's that's the key difference right there. Yep. <laughs> Interesting, Davis. A nickname is a nickname, and I have one, and I've made you proud, father. I'm Steve Interesting Davis. Interesting. And it's stuck all these years. <laughs> Steve 
interesting Davis. <laughs> Davis became the Bjorn Borg and Man United of the Green Bays. With numbing predictability, he reached his fourth World Championship final in 1985. His... <laughs> <laughs> like, just numbing. It's a numbing predictability. It's like, <laughs> there is no flair. Like, those <laughs> There's no flair. He's just methodical. Yeah. He's just, just like, uh, what well, I, I would compare. If I were to, if I were to, and I, I, I love, I love both uh, athletes. They're both my heroes. But I would, I would compare, like a, like a Michael Jordan to a Larry Bird. Yeah. You know, yeah. as far as intensity. I mean, even though Larry Bird was intense, but it's like bounce passes and proper <laughs> proper old school basketball like the old school rules kind mm -hmm. of thing and yeah. it's just i love that i would hate to be like with <laughs> with numbing predictability damn yeah yeah i guess damn. the closest numbing predictability i could think of of any sport right now is probably max verstappen in formula one like just winning almost every single race by like 20 seconds yep and that's the closest i could think of right now oh, that's pretty good that's a pretty good comparison to be honest yeah Interesting. I just, man. <laughs> His opponent was genial Irishman Dennis Taylor, the man with the huge specs. Yeah. Well, you should have a big pack. We checked that one out. Guys, I know, okay, they're specifically made for snooker. Snooker. Like, the frames are lower, so when he bends his head down, he can see through his specs. Mm -hmm. I, I get it. I get it now, but my God, guys, give me an olive branch. That looks ridiculous. <laughs> it does. I'm just but... saying. It's just, okay. <sighs> I had a glasses like this. Didn't I? <laughs> what the hell has he got on his head? The 80s was a time of outrageous spectacles. And Dennis wasn't about to be left out. Okay, you can open them again. <laughs> Suddenly, Dennis Taylor's like, you know, dragging Snooker into that realms of lunacy. There we are. We think we should have a quick look at Dennis. <laughs> There's no way you'd walk around in a pair of those unless it significantly helped you. <laughs> I'd rather miss yachts, you know, than put them on. He used to wear contact lenses, which he found irritated his eyes. So, I decided that I'll have to get glasses. I hope to God he didn't have them made for the family. Because that would have been a weird out in money when they came down the hill. But those glasses made such a difference. And uh, without the spectacles, I don't think I'd ever have been world champion. Looking ridiculous but playing amazingly, he stood shoulder to shoulder, almost with Davis. If I was going to remember anything from all the matches I've played, it would be the final with Dennis Taylor. First frame, Steve Davis to break. Don't remember the 85 final vividly. Steve won every frame in the first session. I wanted the floor to open up in the Crucible Theatre. Um, Steve wasn't missing a shot. We turn up, Davis does the business, we go home with a trophy, bring a low load around the back for the prize money and go home and have a beer. Got psyched up for the first couple of frames of the evening session. Steve won the first frame, 8-0. Well, a perfect performance by Steve Davis. Eight frames to nil. There I was, eight nil in front. Looking around, lost the plot. One shot changed the whole final round. Steve took a green down the cushion and it uh, wobbled in the jaws of the pocket. If it had gone in, it was nine nil. And, mm. and I cleared the colours up to win my first frame. And then we finished the first day's play. I was only two behind at nine seven. Six frames in a row. Performance by Dennis Taylor. Steve Davis looked invincible at the start of the day. Dennis Taylor has played beautifully this evening to narrow the gap to only two frames. And the second day was a complete nightmare for me. It, it was survival to try and get to the finishing line, and it was destined to go all the way. Mm. Oh, man. So Steve Davis concedes, and it's 15-14. And it's there. And 
and the audience is thrilled as Dennis Taylor. Now one frame behind at 17-16. It was nip and tuck right to um, right to the very last frame. And so the lights go down. The players shake hands. One of these lucky chaps will pick up the wow. title, the trophy, and £60,000. Afterwards, someone asked, uh, how long do you think that frame lasts? And I thought it was about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. It was 68 minutes, the wow. final frame. There were oh so many God. safety shots played. Wow. In general, it was total garbage. He couldn't pot a ball. I remember potting the last red and failing to get on the, the colour. I'm not sure if you can see that big. And I have this ingrained memory of handing the rest back to John Williams, the referee. But I didn't want to let go of it because I knew I wasn't on the next ball. 25. I needed the brown, blue, pink and black to win and I'd made my mind up I was just going to go for any sort of shot. I wasn't going to lose it trying to play a safety shot. And I did pot a fantastic brown. Damn. It was one of the best pots I've made under pressure. And then I remember potting quite a difficult blue. The crucible now erupting. So we just quiet down, please. <laughs> And a pot of... Can we just quiet down, please? <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. Cool, man. <laughs> you're you're the life of every party. Yeah. I can see why this particular match was requested a lot when we asked for individual snooker matches. Wow, but that was 68 minutes, guys. Come on. Come on yeah. now. You wanted us to watch the whole thing? Come on. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> There, there are other things we'll watch for sixty-eight minutes, but sporting yeah. event, not so much. I'm or, sorry. Or, or, or at least, or at least we. I mean, we didn't know. We wouldn't know enough to jump into that. You know. Right. So at least it, now, I feel like we we could we could because then we could take over the commenter's job. Something like and that. And that could be fun. Yeah, maybe. Quite a difficult pink as well with the white bit on the cushion. The final frame, the final black. And I always remember where the black was sitting because it was tight on the side cushion just above the middle pocket. What do you do with this one, Dennis? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And I remember then Dennis starting to have a go at trebles. Turn the light to play the double. It goes in a win. If it doesn't, I don't. Yeah! <laughs> Missed the pocket by a fraction. And I was lucky because the black went safe on the top cushion. And uh, Steve Davis played one of the best safety shots I've ever seen under pressure. He doubled the black from one end of the table to the other, missing the white by a fraction. And my next shot confused Steve because I tried to double the black from the bottom cushion into the top pocket. Hit it. Hard enough if it didn't go in that pocket, it might fluke it in the bottom pocket. Missed both pockets and it went safe again. And uh, really, when Steve missed his next shot, that gave me the first chance to be world champion. Oh! And I remember just getting down a little bit and thinking, I'm going to fluke this black into this top pocket. And when I seen it wasn't going in, walked back. Had a quick glance at the table, went back and thought, it's all over. That was the biggest shot of his life. This cuts. Even though it's going to be thin, I can cut it in. And I got out of my chair, and that was a bit slow motion. He said, my legs had gone, my arm couldn't hold the cue. This is my cue. Somebody's given me another cue for this shot. I have never known an atmosphere like this. I remember watching it on like, a little portable TV in the snooker club. I was the only one rooting for Steve Davis to win. <laughs> I remember sitting there in the club and they'd all be going, ah, oh, miss it, Ginger, miss it, Ginger. And it was a shot that Steve Davis would knock in 999 times out of a thousand. There was no way Steve Davis was going to miss that black. I was telling my think to myself, I think, don't undercut it, because that is the, the way you bottle it. 
and I think probably talk myself into overcutting it. No. Oh, I couldn't believe my eyes. That's right. I'm sure. so, you know, it's like seeing Tiger Woods miss a two foot putt. <laughs> <laughs> Walks around and sits down. Saw so the, the white ball whisk round the table, and I knew full well that it was going to be a, a very easy pot. But there was so much pressure on both of us at that stage that you couldn't miss. You couldn't miss anything. Out comes Taylor, his face like a beetroot. In fact, throughout that last frame, he was getting whiter by the shot, and I was getting redder by the shot. <laughs> this is really unbelievable. Every nerve in his body was literally shaking. Probably Ted Lowe was more nervous in the commentary box that, than I was out on the table. Yeah. He's done it. He did it. And the way I reacted afterwards was just... I couldn't believe that was me sort of stamping the cue and raising the cue and... One of them... It was cute. Yeah, it was all this, wasn't it? It was all this. It's all that. Bit of that. He had a friend in the audience who's behind, and he was doing it the old "I told you so." Dennis Taylor, for the first time, becomes Embassy World Snooker Champion, Man. 1985. It was just 13. It was just as intense the second time around as it was watching it now. Yeah. The first time. Wow. <sighs> oh my God. Oh my God! To to think of that, just to well, I mean, dude, I couldn't imagine the amount of pressure on these guys. Oh yeah, yeah. I just this is the this is the world this is the the Super Bowl this is the World Cup this is everything. Mm -hmm. You're gonna miss the ridiculous shots. You're gonna miss them. Like, oh, pretty much, pretty man. much. Years of trying to be world champion, all sort of coming out in them few seconds. He is so thrilled. I remember Steve's expression at the end of it, and David Vine, I think it, David asked him the question. Steve, it's a, a pretty tough moment, this one, isn't it? Yes. I was criticised for being miserable after that, which was quite funny as well. To me, it was a complete failure that I'd lost that match. He was just sat in the corner in his dressing room, crying his eyes out. Two months then of devastation afterwards where I just couldn't get over it. I mean, how are you supposed to react in that <sighs> situation? It'd be like a, 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 a field goal kicker missing the extra point. Yeah, and losing the Super Bowl on that one. You know? I, I, yeah, yeah, you just don't talk to them. They'll, they'll, they're going to have to disappear for a couple months. Yeah, they they're just going to gonna have to find some sort of uh, yeah. self-realizing journey. They need to just work it out yeah. on their own yeah they'll come back just give and them time what's, what's worse is that he it wasn't like he was bad beat it wasn't like this guy just swept him it literally all came down to the last shot that he could have and he easily has made a harder shots yeah yeah and he totally steve totally flubbed it no oh, man mm -hmm. it obviously was one of the biggest sporting moments, you know, everyone will remember that, even though it was 17 years ago, which is a long, long time. Probably if we had a thought that there was going to be 18 and a half to near 19 million people still watching after midnight, maybe we might have not known what we were doing then. I mean, to get in the top 10 of the, the greatest sporting moments of all time is, is, is incredible. Suddenly, snooker was sexy. Forget skateboards, forget swing ball. The must-have kids accessory of the 80s was a snooker table. Wow. In the 80s, snooker was the number one sport. The whole game, the image of the game became uplifted. More and more people wanted to play. Suddenly, there were hundreds of new snooker halls opening because everyone trying to cash in on this boom, and it went from there. So I'm going to ask something that I asked in some other videos here, but kind of different. Where in the United Kingdom and in Ireland is a great snooker hall? Yeah. And why is it better than the other ones in the area? And what day of the week 
is snooker week or day or if that's a whole thing. I don't know how that works. Uh, can I just rock up there and play? That's a good question. Good question. I, I'm definitely interested in to hear to read or sorry to reading the answer to that question. Yeah, that's for sure. Bring them on. Yep. What? <laughs> so this is now a vital moment in this year's World Professional Snooker Championship final. Has anybody got ten p? <laughs> and what a disastrous stroke! And the referee's none too pleased either. What I bet he drinks Carling Black Label. No. Just about every kid had a Steve Davis snooker table from somewhere. It's every player's dream to make a complete clearance. And to show you just how good I think this pop black table really is, I'm going to try and do just that. Because we sold millions of it. <laughs> Take a look at all this. Everything. Barry Hearn's matchroom organisation even moved into the bedroom. What? It's a snooker table duvet cover. We had some sad products. Oh, How we got involved with a matchroom aftershave, I'll never know. When you play to win, you need to keep cool. It didn't make an impact. It didn't take any business off higher karate. The players each chose which scent they were going to wear. We had different sample bottles, A, B, C, D. We'd narrowed it down to four. So there was me and Tony oh, Mio going down in the lift in the morning, and me going to him, what have you got on today? And he'd say, I've got B on. I'd say, oh, I've got A, have a smell of that. And these people were like, what the hell's going on here? Whatever game you play, play to win. The same sense as Steve Davis. Wouldn't you rather just, like, cover yourself in feces? Because you'd have more chance of copping off, wouldn't you? There was also the uh, matchroom slippers which I think were a, were a big hit. Slippers? If the aftershaves worked, the next thing you want, you know, it's not underwear. Let's draw attention to my feet. The players now had the unmistakable whiff of rock and roll in their nostrils. What? If you like snooker, you'll be familiar with this. Chaz and Dave and the Match Room Mob. Snooker Loopy, eh? What a song that was, huh? <laughs> snooker Loopy. Dreadful. We'll show you what we can do with a load of balls and a snooker cue. Off the red screw back. The yellow, green, brown, blue, pink and black. Pink and black. Just a lot of people learning snooker will we'll never forget that line. You know, say, what's, what's the order? I'll oh, pick the yellow, green, brown, blue, pink and black. A typical Barry Hearn project. Barry Hearn rang our manager and uh, said, I'd love the boys to write a snooker song. He likes country and western. What chance has he got of judging a good song? And they wrote this, uh, I think, a nice little number. I got a phone call. Yes, Steve, I've got this great song. We're going to be pop stars. But the boys had to be rather had their arms twisted, so now we're going to make a record. And it was a bit naff, oh, we don't want to make a record. I kept saying, yeah, but we can't sing. Oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> we're not checking it out. We're not doing it. We've nope. gotten enough of a taste of it from this. Yeah, we're listening to it right now, man. Yeah. It's a oh, banger. Man. Apparently it went to number one, so... Voice of a generation. 100%. Pretty much. <laughs> like, I mean, that's... I thought it was ridiculous, the whole uh, cologne thing and slippers, but now a they, pop song. They capitalize on a movement, which is it's very smart. Very smart to do. You yeah. have to capitalize if you're there. Because if, if that moment passes and then you try to capitalize, it looks like it's, it's a pathetic move. Yeah, yeah. If you're there and you're on fire on all cylinders, you got to capitalize on every cheesy, corny thing that comes out. But in hindsight, they should have just stuck with the snooker table and just yeah. left it there. Hey, man. They had to, I, bet, I bet there's a downtime in, in the, the snooker leagues, right, where they need that little bit extra cash flow from their number one hit snooker song. When? You can <sighs> go inside at any time. Like, 
I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. It's great. It's a great song. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, of course it is. We're going to record it, then we're going to do a video, and it's going to be fantastic, and we'll be on top of the pop. So I'm thinking, oh, don't go there. Please don't go there. It's going to be the most embarrassing thing you've ever done in your life. I tape whizzes through, and I listened to this record, and it was only a demo of it. And I've got to be honest, I thought, blimey, that's catchy. And we went in the recording studio. And everybody had a line, so everybody was happy. What was my line? Obviously, he had them upside down glasses, didn't yeah. he? So yeah. it had to go in it, didn't it? How the old mind boggles. Nowadays, he pots the lot. Because <laughs> I wear those goggles. Because <laughs> I wear these goggles. <laughs> oh, he says goggles. Yeah, he does, yeah. Me and him and me. Going to your local school, pick up your kids, and you can actually hear kids singing it as they come out of the school. And before long, it got in the charts. Number six. Wait. No. But hey, I was on top of the pops. I'm famous. <laughs> That's nuts. Illusions. Uh, what number, the? They were number six. Number That's six. Hey, man. They got on top of the pops. So oh, well. It must have been an interesting time. Yeah. Interesting time. The eighties were weird, man. Hey. Hundred percent. Yep. We thought we were we were the dogs. So all of a sudden, we bring out the follow-up. Called the Romford Rap. Whether you're a penny or a tapper, you're a jump or a jet. That didn't get anywhere in the charts. Which died a death. We don't mention that at all. From Britain, bow on over the Romford Gap. Bombed. You can do the Romford Rap. It's not only footballers that do really crappy songs, is it? Snooker's colourful set of characters compelled millions of viewers to tune into the sport. I think snooker at that time, you know, the t television and snooker went together, didn't it? It was a great, great sport to be on TV. Everyone had a favourite player. Everyone had a player they didn't like. An ongoing soap opera, which uh, I remember Barry Hearn describing once as... Dallas with balls. It wasn't <laughs> just a game. Joe Johnson's a lovely lad. Terrible choice in shoes, I seem to remember. My trademark, as it were, was fancy shoes. Yeah, I used to like his shoes. Yeah, very smart. White shoe. No, Joe. What a tournament to win for your first one. <laughs> Joe Johnson totally outplayed me in the 1986 World Championship. Right here in the Crucible are going mad. For Bradford's Joe Johnson. Who on earth would have thought that Joe from Bradford uh, was going to win the World Championship? I believe I was uh, 150 to 1 at the start of the World Championship, and I wish I'd have had a few above on then. And Joe Johnson defeats Steve Davis, 18 frames to 12. Goodness. And Joe will uh, look at himself in the mirror for the rest of his life and say, I won the biggest event in my chosen sport. Giddy with his newfound fame, Joe committed the ultimate folly of even thinking he was quite good at singing. A couple of times I watched him sing on stage, I was thinking, what's going on here? But it was brilliant. Don't you forget, all the you the singing now. Uh... Man, no wonder there was such a huge uh, underground scene in, you, in England in the 80s with Manchester and all that. It was to get as far away from this shit as possible. Yeah, man. Yeah, I, 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 I concur. I concur. Mm -hmm. Just because you. <sighs> anyway, I'll listen to the Smiths over this. I'll just put it that way. And that's that's a big statement right there. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was never really a singer, and uh, I, I was only doing that really um, as a bit of fun. Snooker even produced a sex symbol from Bolton. And all because the ladies loved Tony Knowles. The girls loved Tony. He was over six foot tall, you know, dark, good looking. 
when a, a lad comes up to me and he always says, uh, my mum used to fancy you. <laughs> and we used to call him the melter because they just used to go like chocolate bars. We ended up at the local nightclub there last night. <laughs> yeah. Until what time? <laughs> Until about two o'clock after. He was the playboy. Uh, in was Tony loved the publicity. At the time, a lot of people actually said that I looked similar to Shaking Stevens. It ended up with the son actually doing a picture of me on page seven. There was quite a few page three girls there as well at the same time. <laughs> now, the question is, did he ever did do the full Monty in certain places? Oh, there you go. There you go. You heard it, right? Yep. Okay, yep. good. Good, good, <laughs> yep. good. Uh, Patreon link in description if you want to see dude, it. Dude, awesome movie. Mm -hmm. It was one of the best we've checked out. Yep. Mm -hmm. Our association thought that it was actually bringing the game into disrepute at the time, uh, and I did get fined. If it did bring somebody into disrepute, it wasn't Snooker, it was Tony. And he got £5,000 fine from our association. What a liberty. He should try to get his money back. While Tony attracted the young ladies, the housewife's choice was definitely Canadian Cliff Thorburn. Hmm. With his magnum tash, he was the Rhett Butler of the Crucible Theatre. And don't play him for money at pool. Cliff became famous for making crucible history in his match against Terry Griffiths in 83. There's something magical about uh, ultimates in any sport, aren't there? Couldn't possibly wish to have the balls in a better position than this. Now, the first one for seven in the World Championships is very, very special. In fact, I had a dream about two weeks before that, you know, that I was going to make a one four seven run. I remember he flew to red. I missed it. Well, a simple shot, really. Misses the red and the bottom pocket. Hits the jaws. Went across the top. And struck a ball that was uh, a foot from the pocket. Knocked it in. One. Staying on the black as well. My word, that's a bonus. And he just kept going and going. And we'd never seen this, and I thought, is he going to do it? I knew after I made the second or third black, you know, they had a chance to make a 147. It wasn't very good, right? Watching someone do a 147 when your eyes break yourself up to that point was 18. 15 reds later, he was still on the black. God, he's going to do it. I wasn't really that nervous. Uh, I, you know, I couldn't feel any nerves, really. Typical Canadian. Wow. Holding it all in here, but. He, he is m knocking it out of the so park. So is this the, the first 147 recorded on the first break? Is that what, what he was saying? It was like the first the first break, they rate the, the opening of the whole game, and he just goes and does a, pulls a 147? Is that, so is that the first time ever? Let me know yeah. in the comments. Yeah. 15 reds and 15 blacks that he's taken now. I was uh, on the yellow ball and I was uh, all set to shoot. They stopped play on the other table. Bill Werbenach stuck his head around the corner. There's just this little head like Mr. Chad. It's very difficult not to see Bill Werbenach when he puts his head around the corner. Was he actually around there cheering him on or was he mind sweeping? Just after nicking drinks, you know, because he's thinking if you don't for a 147 break, you're not going to have your eye on your pint of mild, are you? I'm thinking to myself, not now, Bill, you know. Get out of the way, you know, and it was all that. My brother rang someone else's house to tell them that they had to put the snooker on because, you know what I mean, it looked like he was, he was going to make this 147 break. Well, the green and the brown and the, rolled the blue on the side, and then I realised that the pink wasn't on the spot. I mean, just like so wrapped up. It was almost like I was every spectator in the place. There's going to be another moment in Cliff's life when he's going to be so tense as this. Cliff, 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 Cliff. On the black, I can't tell you how good I felt on that. I just wanted to make sure that, I, uh, that the black never even touched the job. Jack Carnham was doing the commentary. And Jack, in my mind, issued the best line of commentary ever issued by a snooker commentator. Oh, good luck, mate. 
perfect. And the black went down. Straight in. Oh, wonderful! The man. man sinks to his knees. He goes, yeah! The arms in the air, everybody rushing in. Terry's come up, Bill's come uh, hurtling round the corner, you know. Bill came round and he went to put his arms round us, and you're not going to tell him no, are you? You know, I put my arms around both of them and I, you know, just, you know, banged my head for it. And I actually, you know, gave him a real good headbutt each. Oh! <laughs> they the and everything and the whole of Crucible seemed to stop. I was in doing uh, grocery shopping over the microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, Cliff Thorburn has just made a per the first perfect game in the World Championship. I think that's the answer to your question. Yep. There you go. That's awesome. That's a sporting moment. For yeah. this for that's like a sporting history moment for this. That's oh, yeah. that's awesome. That's awesome. Wow. Hell hell yeah. I went out back and uh this young lad asked me for my autograph and I couldn't even sign my name. My hand was just flopping around like a seal. Eighteen thousand quid and good luck there. But there were other ways for snooker players to line a pocket than with a well-judged red. International stardom and nice little learners were the order of the day. We had ten years of actually a circus of going round almost WWF style and everyone became very famous in their own right. And we ended up everywhere from Sao Paulo in Brazil, Hong Kong, Dallas in America, India, Tokyo in Japan, Australia. China wanted a snooker exhibition, snooker matches. Off you go to China. We did the first show ever in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. And Barry Hearn was keen to find out how many might watch on television because we had this great audience of 18 and a half million that watched our final. And the fellow said, well, you'll probably get somewhere between 150 and 200 million. <laughs> Jimmy White even chalked up a co-starring role in the film Legend of the Dragon, unaccountably overlooked by the Academy Awards. Aww. We had done it in a big leisure centre and with all sort of gangster type. Chinese guys, it was good, it was a great film. In one of the shots, he jumped off a springboard, he went about 20 foot in the air. Yeah! <laughs> and that come down and done a massage shot. What the? Well, that's got to be a foul shot, four away, an opponent's ball anywhere in the D, surely. Don't applaud, Jimmy. <laughs> well, while some were enjoying the ka factor and foreign frolics of the snooker boom, the game's original self-style superstar was heading for self-destruction. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Controversial, temperamental, but a terrific talent for the game of snooker. One of the most talented players. His lifestyle was disgraceful. Drinking, gambling, womanising, you name it. We've all nipped behind a bush when we're caught short, but not at the crucible. <laughs> he was guilty of urination in the flower arrangement. Um, I don't think it did any harm to anybody, just the fact that he got caught was the thing, wasn't it? I imagine he pissed in people's drinks just for the giggle, just to keep it lively. <laughs> but Alex's clowning was becoming less and less funny. Police officers interviewed the snooker player Alex Hurricane Higgins today about an allegation that he headbutted a competition official. I'm positive he, he wasn't aware that he was actually in the middle of some snooker tournament. He, he, he just thought someone was looking at his lass. Paul Hatherall, director of the UK Championships, says he was headbutted and verbally abused. Alex dropped his pint, grabbed his tie, and headbutted him at the side of the head, split his eye wide, wide open. And the ideal thing is that. I turn around and have to wait the outcome. Oh my god, oh my He got about a £2,000 fine and he was banned for five tournaments the next season. I've had run ins with that particular person for about five or six years. Are you sorry? 
I'm sorry, yes, of course I'm sorry. But there was a lot more trouble to come. Alex was in the Irish world team with Dennis Taylor. He just, just lost it completely and um, said things that he probably didn't mean to say, threatened to have me oh shot the next God. time I went back home to Northern Ireland. Uh, but it wasn't so much that, he said a very personal thing about uh, a member of my family and I thought, well, you know, I'm not standing for that. Are you still upset about what he said? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> that'll take a while. Soon after, Alex and Dennis were drawn to play each other in the Irish Masters. Oh, my God. I was determined I wasn't going to lose that match. I'll never forget standing in the dressing room, looking at the mirror and, and just talking to myself and shouting at myself, saying, you can't lose, you can't lose. He played some really flamboyant shots where he could have just potted the, the pink and finished the frame. He not only played to the crowd, it was a little bit, he wanted to really rub your nose in it. He wanted to humiliate you. Whoa. You know, I wanted to win for so many reasons, and sure enough, I, I beat Alex 5-2. And Alex Higgins concedes and shakes hands with Dennis Taylor. That was just a, a little bit of revenge. Goodness, man. What a rough, rough road for Higgins. Woo. Man. Mm. Yeah, like, getting caught urinating and headbutting and... Uh, it's spiraling. Yeah. But, you know, I kind of figured that he would be the one that spiraled. To he's the, the eat. rock star. Yeah, he's the rock, he's the rock and roll snooker player. Yeah. Like, that makes sense. He does what he, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, pretty much. It's unfortunate. It's a tale as old as time. Yeah, yeah. Defeat in the first round of the World Championships by Steve James in 1990 left Alex with sorrows even he couldn't drown. came down to the press conference and Colin Randall, who was a press officer, said to him, thanks for coming down, Alex. And with that, Alex punched him in the stomach. No reason whatsoever. This game is the most corrupt game in the world. And you get absolute tosses doing jobs for exorb exorbitant money. Well, I don't really want to be part of that. So you can shove your snooker up your jack say, I'm not playing no more. Wow. And he'd said it because it was in his blood, you know. I'm wondering, did he really mean it? Or would he come back and carry on again? So I would like to announce my retirement from professional stuff. Oh, wow. For that and the Dennis Taylor crime, and he was banned for a year and stripped of all his ranking points. I'm disappointed, but uh, I'll just have to take it like a man which effectively um, meant that he was back to square one and could never get back into the top part of the game again. So when he came back, he had to go right back to round one qualifying against a new breed of player that was coming through in the 90s. Um, and he couldn't do it. Oh, my God. So was the glass half empty or half full? Was the hurricane a tragic drunk or the man who transformed snooker? My brother made snooker. I don't think it ever came to the height that it did get to, unless he had been in it. A wind of change was blowing through snooker. The mantle of people's champion passed from the hurricane to whirlwind Jimmy White. Watching poetry in motion, really, you know, it's just, it was magic, you know, Jimmy, the way he played the game, he's got every shot in the book. That was so brilliant, it was laughable. Jimmy, without any doubt, is the greatest snooker player never to have won the world title. You always wanted him to win, A, because he was just a little bit naughty, but he had kind of that erratic behaviour, so you could never predict. He was a, a product of the, the billiard hall system. When I was about 11, I used to go in a club called Zags. He used to knock about, you know? He couldn't read and write in them days because he never went to school in the early years. We used to nip off during school hours and uh, play in the snow crawl. Most people done their Christmas shopping in them, you know, so much sort of stolen stuff gone in there. Just rough places where you get villains. Um, 
and you get me and Jimmy. <laughs> Through playing truant from school, we used to hide in the snow court, away from the police, because the police in them days used to come and, if you had a uniform on, they used to come and drag you back to school. The teachers <laughs> knew about it. And my headmaster, Mr Beatty, he uh, used to let me have time off to play snooker. It's nice, Jimmy, to see him. Man, that's crazy that you hide from the police in a snooker hall. Like, I guess in the States that would be the basketball courts, or just on the yeah. the back streets in general. Yeah, pretty pretty much. That's crazy though. I, I, it, it's just a whole different. If it's this whole thing is just a window into a place that I didn't even know existed. It's yeah. nuts. It's like the the subculture behind snooker is insane. Yeah, yeah. It's to to the American eye, like something that you have to wear, you know, suit and ties with is considered very soft and very uh not not very uh for the everyman. But this is yeah. this is for the everyman right here. I like this man. It's it's just different, man. I, it's it's crazy that it had that much draw. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's I don't know. It it's absolutely wild. But I get it. I get it. I can get it. I can get behind it now. Knowing yeah. some of the characters in that make Snooker what it what it was, how it or what it is now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think in actual fact I'm seeing more of you now than I did when you used to come to school. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> oh, is it more too much more? Jimmy teamed up with pop star Svengali, Harvey Lisberg, who decided it was time for a new image. I'm creating a visual image. Um, just the appearance is going to be looked after for the sex point of view, the sex image for the women viewers. He managed Bernard Manning, 10cc. I think the head it takes the image, so let's just consider what about a punk hairstyle? No, I'm not terribly keen on that. They gave him a real makeover. Now, what I'm thinking of doing, actually, is to perm the hair to give the body here on the top. My and teeth needed to be done anyway, but he went overboard. He had my hair permed and all sorts of things. <laughs> Pictures done with Lord Litchfield. Great experience, you know, but uh, it wouldn't have been my idea. Well, I see um, him in five years' time as um, the Kevin Keegan of snooker. But all the blue Stratos and Cossack hairspray in the world couldn't win Jimmy that elusive world championship title. I've won every other tournament the game's ever had. I just haven't won the world championships. You know, Jimmy's been in six finals, which is still a feat in itself. But hasn't managed to win one. And with that break of 71, Stephen Hendry beaten Jimmy White. It's probably fate. He wasn't meant to win it. John Parrott's waited a long time for this. Finally, the world with Jimmy White concedes to John Parrott. But he just keeps bouncing back. Just like Higgins had faced Davis in the 80s, Jimmy's nemesis was Stephen Hendry. As Stephen goes out in a blaze of glory, he becomes the 1992 Embassy World Champions. So Stephen Hendry finishes off as he started. A really magnificent finish. Goodness. We couldn't have a better champion. Oh, no, not again. And you just wanted him to do it. 99% of the crowd is going to be against you. And that was a great motivation for me. I'm quite pleased that Stephen Hendry came along and, and beat Jimmy White because people used to blame me for Jimmy White not winning the World Championship. <laughs> the time when he should have won it, um, I was there ready to go out and fight for just look at the scores, 17 frames each, 24 points each. Henry was in his chair, and when Jimmy missed that vital black, Henry did not see it. I put the red in the middle, and the balls were absolutely perfect. And I've come round, and I'm really shaking, I'm under a lot of pressure, I'm going to be world champion. And I got down and I rushed it back, I sort of slung my cue at it. He suddenly heard this tremendous, ah! Oh! Ah! Oh. And Jimmy had missed it. It was the ball to win him the world title at last. Oh, man! Totally gutted, absolutely gutted, because I worked so hard to get myself together and everything, and uh, it was not to be. A cry for this gentleman sitting in the chair there. Stephen Henry. Yeah. Hey! 
that he's the best player in the world. If I retire and I've not won it, I will be a bit bitter for a couple of years. What can I say apart from happy birthday? <laughs> he's beginning to annoy me. <laughs> Hendry went on to win seven world titles and millions of pounds in prize money. It was all a long way from billiard halls, brill cream and pot black. It was a human game that perhaps some sports don't have. People were inventing all these characters and it was great. The most fun I've ever had. We used to have a right good laugh, you know. It was a wonderful time in my life. And we made a few quid as well. Right, what a hell of a doc. Hey man, I like that a lot. I think that humanized snooker to me and yeah. made it more accessible to me and knowing the characters that are in there made it more fun. It's for me. it's definitely like a uh, like a, a tame version of WWE. <laughs> Each one has their characteristics and their their character that they they thought up and it's 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 awesome. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's what you want behind a spectator sport. Hell yeah. And you don't yeah. want to be bored to death. And that's hey man, that's I, I'm I'm here for it. Hell so, yeah. So let's know more uh snooker to check out in terms of individual players, individual sure. matches. Uh we've certainly got a lot of the classics here. I saw Ronnie O'Sullivan in there as well. Mo yep. I guess it's like 03, 04 this mm -hmm. came out, and he was the current world champion at the time. So let's keep it going, y'all. Yeah, there's still a lot on the table, unintended. And, yeah, that's a good one, by the way. <laughs> Basically, what we'll do is we'll, on Mondays, we'll alternate snooker and darts mm -hmm. and uh, to keep our sanity uh, intact. Yes, or what semblance there is left of sanity. Exactly. But anyway, thank y'all for watching. Consider subscribing, watching another video. And what else, Dan? Unplug and go play some snooker, guys. Exactly. See y'all next time. Later. Fellas, we could be that mistake. Let's do this.